This paper is an experiment of sorts. In it, I work to stitch together two lines of argument that I've been developing relatively autonomously from one another. The first line of argument stems from a critical reading of Michael Warner's important 2002 essay, Publics and Counterpublics, which Ilana uh, mentioned in her question to Celia Lurie. Uh, I love this uh, uh, essay and the book in which it's uh, included. Uh, I really do. Uh, but the more times that I read it, the more I'm convinced that the model of publicity that it presents is burdened by several liberal prejudices that limit its conception of mass media processes and the politics that are organized through them. The second line of argument stems from my ongoing research on a massive government-sponsored nation branding project that was recently undertaken in the, uh, in the Republic of Macedonia. Motivating this research has been my interest in examining how branding imperatives to regulate public communication, that is to advance preferred representations of the brand and to limit unwanted ones, have been taken up as a practice of contemporary statecraft. Rest assured, however, that the needlework of this experiment is not haphazard. In conceptualizing publicity, Warner maps out a model of participation in publics. For example, he highlights how particular forms of attention and address based on subjects' reflexive orientation to imagine trajectories of textual circulation are essential to one's participation in a public. Furthermore, he links a historically specific ideology of mass publicity, of ongoing self-organized mass mediated communication among an open-ended set of peers as instrumental to modern political movements that express their authority and legitimacy through idioms of popular sovereignty. My research on nation branding and politics in Macedonia builds on some of Warner's fundamental insights on publics. Drawing on Warner, I conceptualize publics as, here I'm quoting him, an intertextual environment of circulation and implication, ones that are governed by particular participation norms and meta-pragmatic discourses. However, whereas Warner recurrently highlights the creative, agentive, and world-making capacity of mass publicity, my own research in Macedonia examines forms of strategic communications and censorship, that is, sets of social and legal practices that work to shape and limit the intertextual environment of publics and to harness attention. In stitching between these lines of argument then, I tack from a perspective that celebrates the vitality of publicity, its ability to conjure worlds of collective sharing, to one that confronts elite efforts to engineer and enclose public spheres. Through this experiment, this idiosyncratic quilting together, I worked to pinpoint attention that I see in Warner's essay, when rooted in his ambivalent engagement with the liberal model of publicity, and via juxtaposition with the Macedonian case to contribute an alternative view on contemporary practices of publicity. Thus, in threading between Warner's model of publicity and my research on branding, I ask, how do we as analysts go about locating and scaling the structures and practices that mediate participation in mass publics? And how do these decisions affect the analyses that we produce? In doing so, I hope to offer a few useful reflections on the politics of participation in the age of mass publicity. So let me begin with a few words on Warner's publics and counterpublics, although Ilana's question to Celia uh, basically summarized this in two sentences. I, I might take a, 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 few, a few minutes to do so. Uh, in the essay, Warner conceptualizes a public as a historically specific socio-political form predicated on address to unknown open, an, an unknown open-ended audience of strangers who are oriented to a shared horizon of textual circulation. That is, publicity presupposes a shared intertextual environment of news, commentary, discussion, opinion, parody, and so on, to which an indeterminate open-ended group of participants variously aligns through their attention to text and textual circulation, through their contribution of new text to an intertextual environment in dialogue with uh, precedents, anticipating responses, and through their discussion and recontextualization of texts. It is in this sense that Warner describes publics as based on a reflexive orientation to textual circulation. Participation, whether through attention or contribution, applies awareness of a broader ongoing discussion. Perhaps the paradigmatic example of a public is a news public, whether based on some territorial delimitation, the nation, the municipality, some shared interest, uh, hip hop, doll collecting, or some shared identity based on gender, sexuality, race, or religion. Media publications produce and circulate accounts of happenings and events that are then subjected to further discussion, debate, or parody, or which might become the background knowledge made relevant in later contributions. 
In terms of history, Warner locates and dates the emergence of, here I'm quoting, the ability to address the world made up by the circulation of cross-referencing discourse, end quote, over the late 16th to the late 18th century in the West, as he refers to it. Uh, clearly, too, the rise of the printing press and print capitalism are crucial to this history. In this regard, Warner's account uh, parallels that of Jürgen Habermas in his work, The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere. Both recognize the emergence of a bourgeois public sphere in early modern Europe as transformative of politics. However, Warner diverges from Habermas in that he does not see the bourgeois public sphere as a normative ideal. Rather, Warner focuses on how the unmarked participation norms that characterize bourgeois publicity, that is, particular speech genres that privileged white, male, heterosexual, Christian property owners, accomplish two things. First, they served as a condition of possibility for universalist notions of liberal democracy and the public as a particular embodiment of political sovereignty. Second, to, second the barriers to participation that resulted from the pseudo-universalist norms also grounded the emergence of so-called counterpublics. Werner argues that like mainstream publics, counterpublics are predicated on forms of public address and participants' reflexive orientation to textual circulation. What distinguishes counterpublics are the norms, uh, for example, in terms of speech genres or topic selection that mediate participation. One finds in, work, uh, one finds in Warner's work on publics and counterpublics, then, a genealogy of contemporary identity politics, the critical analysis of which Warner has developed in his contributions to queer theory and his interventions in queer politics. So this is my quick overview of Warner on publics. It's, I'm sure, very familiar to some of you, uh, uh, less familiar to others of you. Uh, in my mind, it is brilliant stuff, and my own analyses of cultural politics uh, of public spheres in Macedonia would be impossible without it. But, but, uh, for some time now, I've been bothered by what I see as a tension in Warner's account of publicity. At times, the essay he is charting, at times in the essay, he is charting a critical reading of bourgeois liberal publics as a historical form rooted in the North Atlantic Enlightenment. At other times, he uses the model of liberal publicity when constructing a general account of publicity as a social form. Let me explain. When Warner concentrates on elaborating his general account of publicity, he often imagines publicity from the perspective of individual participants. Here, public address appears as something that is elective, performative, and experimental. As Warner writes, public discourse says, let a public exist, and says not only let a public exist, but let it have this character, speak this way, see the world this way. It then goes out in search of confirmation that such a public exists with greater or lesser success. Success being further attempts to cite, circulate, and realize the world understanding that it articulates. Run it up the flagpole and see who salutes. Put on a show and see who shows up. Here, public address and its imaginative world-making powers seemingly presuppose an unencumbered autonomous subject, one trying things out. Participation and the excitement of participation stem from the risk of extending one's world understanding across a field of stranger peers and seeing how they will respond. The sense of active and elective participation appears elsewhere in the essay as well. Indeed, Warner links it to the very imagination of publics as political agents when he writes, I quote, the existence of a public is contingent on members' activity, however notional or compromised, and not on its members' categorical classification, right? It's, uh, we, it's elected participation, not ascribed participation. Uh, uh, he then continues, publics lacking any institutional being commence with the moment of attention, must continually predicate renewed attention, and cease to exist when attention is no longer predicated. They are virtual entities, not voluntary associations. Because their threshold of belonging is active uptake, however, they can be understood within the conceptual framework of civil society. That is, as having a free, voluntary, and active membership. Wherever a liberal conception of personality obtains, the moment of uptake that constitutes a public can be seen as an expression of volition on the part of its members. Uh, I'll, I'll stop the quote here. I want to pause simply to underscore how this conception of a voluntaristic, agentive public recapitulates a liberal conception of the public sphere. Now, to be fair, Warner acknowledges this. He adds, the caveat, he adds caveats such as, uh, in the, the above quote, wherever a liberal conception of personality obtains. At other places, he describes the imaginary of agentive, open-ended, egalitarian address as a practical fiction one that is belied by conditions and norms on public participation. 
Thus, for example, he writes, a public seems to be self-organized by discourse, but in fact requires pre-existing forms and channels of circulation. It appears to be open to indefinite strangers, but in fact selects participants by criteria of shared social space, habitus, topical concerns, intergeneric references, and circulating intelligible forms. These criteria inevitably have a positive content. They uh, enable confidence that the discourse will circulate along a real path, but they limit the extension of that path. That is, he highlights the restrictions and exclusions that structure participation in publics and bear on who can claim to represent the public. However, despite his acknowledgement of the, the positive content of forms and channels of circulation, uh, content that, that limits participation in the public, his overarching account of publics minimizes these constraints. Consider, for example, the theses that he presents on publicity as the very structure of the essay. There were seven, this is the seven different sections of the essay. A public is self-organized. A public is a relation among strangers. The address of public speech is both personal and impersonal, uh, per, uh, personal and, and so on. In these theses, it is a liberal, agentive, volitional model of the public that is privileged as the basis for his more general account. Similarly, when Warner turns to theorize counter-publicity, he does so on the basis of the liberal model, as I suggested above. In essence, in the essay, Warner works to relativize and criticize the liberal model of publicity. I, I acknowledge this and I appreciate this. But he also uses this model to theorize publicity in general. The result, I argue, is an uneasy tension. He does describe the structures and norms that constrain publicity, but more so, he indulges in a liberal fantasy of elective world-making action. As I see it, the separation of participation from larger structures and infrastructures that mediate participation results in a certain flatness to how publicity is imagined. It is as if the reflexive circulation of, of discourse has a seamless and egalitarian quality. You simply run public discourse up a flagpole and see who salutes. My recent work on nation branding and strategic communications in Macedonia, however, suggests some specific ways in which we might complicate this picture. Uh, so there is much that I could say about the mass media public sphere in Macedonia and its transformation between the years 2006 and 2016. But for the sake of time, I want to focus on a set of elite practices that sought to regiment the forms of participation that were permissible in the country's mass news public. This time period, 2006 to 2016, encompasses Nikola Gruevsky's tenure as prime minister. Nikola Gruevsky. Uh, he was just sentenced to a two-year term in prison. When elected as prime minister in 2006, Gruevsky primarily positioned himself as an economic reformer, focusing on neoliberalizing the, uh, liberalizing the Macedonian economy and attracting foreign investment. He launched, launched several initiatives towards this end, including a massive, very controversial urban renovation project that sought to make Skopje, Macedonia's capital, more European, as well as connected efforts to brand Macedonia as an attractive business and tourist destination through the Macedonia Timeless Campaign. I showed you the logo of it in, the, this, uh, in an earlier slide. However, as his time leading the country progressed, he and his party, the Vamaro da Pamana E, I'll simply abbreviate it to the Vamaro, uh, were increasingly charged with encroachments on media freedom, abuse of office, and misuse of public funds. After an illegal government surveillance program that targeted over 20,000 people was revealed in uh, 2015, a series of mass protests and political actions began that ultimately resulted in Gruevsky's removal from office. Quite a bit of drama, to be sure, but how did we get here? How did uh, arguably a poster boy of neoliberal reformism come to be repainted as an authoritarian dictator? The answer to this question leads us more deeply into the politics of news media during the Gruevsky years. As I have argued elsewhere, the urban renovation and nation branding project that Gruevsky spearheaded is best understood as an effort to regiment public spheres. That is, through nation branding campaigns among targeted publics abroad, targeted pu publics abroad, uh, elite, uh, imagined as elite investor publics and tourist publics. The Macedonian government sought to advance preferred representations of the nation as a fun place to visit, as a good place to do business, and to marginalize undesirable ones as a poor country, as a country tainted by Yugoslav wars of secession, uh, uh, et cetera. Accompanying these promotional efforts 
targeted abroad, however, were a set of laws, practices, and meta discourses that sought to protect the nation brand and thus to regulate public speech and public, disc uh, and public behavior among publics inside Macedonia. So there was effort to regulate uh, publicity abroad, but also inside Macedonia, I'm arguing. And this materialized in a variety of ways in which the government called on Macedonian citizens to live the brand. I want to share one very uh, kind of astounding example, uh, a public service uh, television campaign uh, that was produced by the government to instruct Macedonians on how to behave before foreign tourists. It was done in a jocular fashion, imagining a crocodile hunter-like character visiting Macedonia, finding endemic species like the, uh, the taxi driver, the annoying taxi driver, uh, the oblivious waiter, and then diagnosing their behaviors as anathema to the nation branding campaign, and telling citizens, you are the face of your country, help us eradicate these negative behaviors. Oops, I think I need to click on... Tonight, we'll try to find a special specimen of Macedonia's endemic species, the Macedonian Alpha Male. This species is not easy to be recognized. She will draw to learn here now how I can let her see. The easiest way to provoke him is to make an impression that you're having a good time and being born helps a lot. This gives you a little bit of, of a taste. So there's a whole series of these commercials, all uh, framing certain types of behaviors as uh, in, a, in a negative way, obviously. Don't do this. And they would always end with this slide. You are the face of your country. Uh, through tourism, uh, 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 good for everyone, brought to you by the Republic of Macedonia, and indeed the government of the Republic of Macedonia, with the seal uh, on display. Uh, there were. Uh, other ways, too, in which this imperative to live the brand was articulated, but you can maybe, uh, you can maybe understand why I chose uh, this specific example. Uh, in addition, at the same time as there were calls uh, uh, like this uh, that were uh, shown on Macedonian television stations again and again and again, uh, critic, uh, uh, so at the same time, uh, critics of the urban renovation and nation branding project, they were very controversial in Macedonia were increasingly labeled by government-friendly media uh, with epithets such as being traitors, being communists, being Sorosians, right, uh, pawns of, of George Soros, uh, as being freaks uh, whose complaints uh, against the Macedonian government risk tarnishing the national image. In consequential ways, such actions marked some forms of participation as permissible in Macedonian public spaces and public spheres while discouraging uh, other uh, forms of participation. Taking a step back, I want to pause simply to characterize uh, this form of intervention into Macedonian publics. In general, the media tactics of nation branding reflect the explosion of branding, marketing, public relations, and communications, as it's often called, as growth industries. Importantly, these elite practices are fundamentally about publicity. They recognize the public interdiscursive circulation of textual and visual artifacts, and then they work to shape trajectories of circulation in instrumental and value producing ways. For instance, brand management exists as a social project that seeks to regiment how commodity objects are represented in publics so as to profit from their circulation in markets. Techniques of public relations are often deployed, for example, in electioneering and among activists to target audiences and promote preferred representations within public spheres. And as Douglas Holmes recently argued, Central bankers now rely on public narration of economic analysis and forecasting as a means to shape economic practice in accord uh, with inflation and growth targets. At the core of such practices are metapragmatic discourses that frame some semiotic objects and some forms of language as appropriate to a particular market or public while framing others as inappropriate. Authorized brand representations are promoted while unauthorized brand representations are sanctioned or one reading of economic data is proffered while other readings are rejected. These practices amount to what could be called discursive engineering, that is interdiscursive and metadiscursive interventions that aim to regiment how objects, knowledge, and representations circulate uh, and thereby contribute to value formation. Of course, these interventions do not uh, overdetermine trajectories of circulation, uh, uh, right as the onion, uh, I think, nicely put it. Uh, 
perfectly marketed TV shows somehow fail. We don't want to. We don't want to. Oh, suspect that these uh, efforts at discursive engineering uh, always have it their way. But I would argue uh, such efforts at least have widespread social in here uh, 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 demonstrable effects on the intertextualities uh, uh, that uh, the intertextual environment, uh, as it were, uh, manifested in publics. Um, as I see it, then, nation branding inspired interventions into the Macedonian public sphere constituted an effort to engineer a particular sort of public. As in the Macedonian case, such efforts at reflect, uh, discursive engineering often channel highly professionalized elite strategies and practices, forms of coordinated uh, multi generic messaging. They also often command sizable resources and legal protect protections that contribute to production values, media access, and media penetration. And finally, they exist not as foundational structuring premises of publicity, but as public address and strangers, uh, such as public address and stranger sociability, but are sustained by typically multiple and repeated interventions into the public sphere uh, and, and that interact with and within the reflexive circulation of discourse. I want to underscore this point. What I'm calling the discursive engineering of publicity contrasts significantly with Warner's general model of publicity. For example, a sustained project of brand management that operates through mass-produced commodities, logos, taglines, uh, advertisements in print, video, and on social media, celebrity endorsements, product placements in film and television, uh, and a division of lawyers, uh, trademark law, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, does not quite compare with the moment of pu public discourse that projects a specific character, way of speaking, and way of seeing the world, and then goes out in search of confirmation that such a public exists. Yes, communications pro projects operate through public address, and any given project's vision of the world is not always taken up and recirculated. But on a basic level, these projects and their ubiquity shape the intertextual environments predicated by uh, mass publicity. Now, there's much more to say about uh, Vomero actions in, in Macedonia uh, and ways in which they work to uh, really colonize uh, mass media um, by uh, 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 by uh, uh, through a, a variety of ways of using uh, state advertising budget to prefer uh, some allied media, uh, shunning journalists and uh, uh, slandering journalists who are oppositional to the party. Uh, 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 I, I have much to say about this, but in, uh, with, due to concern of time, I'm going to, to skip over it uh, and draw to and move on to some some conclusions. Um, so, where, where have we arrived? On the one hand, I've argued that Michael Warner's approach to publicity is burdened by attention. He offers a critical reading of liberal publicity. He identifies the normative difference-making structures that belie claims to generality. But he also models his own account of public and counter-publicity on liberal publicity. In consequence, the yarn that he spins on publicity is colored, I argue, with a faint liberal hue. Although he does mention the norms and pragmatics and metapragmatics that consequentially mediate participation in publics, he nonetheless privileges a rather individualistic and egalitarian view on publicity. Publicity is about trying things out, running a flag up a pole to see who salutes. On the other hand, I have at least presented in broad strokes here a specific case, the transformation of the Macedonian public sphere and politics during the rule of Nikola Gruevsky and his party, the Vamaro, where there was increasing ways to sanction public behavior and a sustained uh, uh, multi-level uh, uh, a process of, of pushing critical media uh, out of the mainstream public sphere. This historical period was marked by intensive and sustained efforts to engineer the intertextual environment of citation and implication that comprised Macedonian publicity and marginalizing critical voices and, and uh, uh, creating uh, an echo chamber, as it were, uh, that had uh, government-friendly media uh, broadcast in a number of different genres and a number uh, of different uh, broadcast outlets, uh, a certain type of intertextual environment, uh, one uh, that was friendly to the government and hostile towards criticism emerged. While this case is admittedly and unfortunately an extreme one, and it did reach extreme dimensions in Macedonia, I argue that the practices and processes used to transform Macedonian mass publicity, that is coordinated communication strategies to advance preferred representations of political reality, 
and to minimize undesirable ones, conform to a more general logic of strategic communications that manifests in branding, marketing, and public relations projects all around the world. So rather than seeing Gruevsky and his party as merely totalitarianism 2.0, uh, I think we need to see how the strategies that, that he and his party were using uh, stem from the, these branding logics, these public relations logics, these strategic communications logics. From Warner's perspective, the Vomero's colonization of Macedonian mass publicity could only be seen as exceptional, as a state-led assault on the self-organizing character of publics that is so crucial to the political imaginaries that they enable. There is an important point here. Uh, and in Macedonia, to be sure, uh, critics of the Vomero government worked passionately to resist government incursion in the Macedonian public sphere and to devise new forums online and in the street through demonstrations that ultimately led to Gruevski's removal from power to reclaim a critical public. Nonetheless, in foregrounding the plight of Macedonian publicity, I contend that instead of seeing such actions as exceptional, as mass publicity gone awry, we should view them as all too commonplace. Efforts to engineer the intertextual environment of publicity are now ubiquitous. While, while most fail to reach the scale and impact that was achieved for a short, term, a short time in Macedonia, we should attend to these processes in their everyday manifestations. We should continue to analyze the forms of public address and interdiscursive change that constitute publics, but we should also look ethnographically and analytically at sustained and coordinated efforts to transform publics. Indeed, in the proliferation uh, of fake news text artifacts and fake news as an epithet in media meta discourse, if there are any indication, uh, and I'm wrapping up, uh, efforts at engineering the intertextual environment of publicity warrant analysis now more than ever before. The view that I've put forward here thus encourages, uh, encourages us to ask, how do states and corporations address publics? And what tools do they, do, do they use to capture the circulatory field that they presuppose as an addressable entity? How might we characterize this variety of participation and its effects on others' capacity to contribute to and shape publics? And asking these questions, we complexify our models of participation in mass publicity. Mass publicity is no longer simply a matter of public address and paying attention. Rather, we must foreground hierarchy, asymmetry, and inequality in public participation, not only in terms of interactional participant roles, but in the interdiscursive consequences of sustained, coordinated, large-scale efforts to shape the form and content of publicity. From this perspective, the participation norms that structure publics appear not as elements in the background, not as context presupposed by public address, but as ongoing interdiscursive and metadiscursive constraints on participation. In the end, this view of publicity leads us away from a model of publicity understood as communication among egalitarian stranger peers, but in doing so, we foreground anew the machinations and struggles over participation in contemporary contexts of mass publicity. Thank you.